My name is Gideon Ralston, and this happened to me in 1983. I had just moved to a small town in Wyoming, looking for a fresh start after my divorce. I was a freelance photographer, scraping by on gigs and living in a small cabin on the outskirts of town. Life was slow, and that's how I liked it. It was peaceful, with the mountains looming in the distance and the quiet serenity of the woods surrounding me. The town itself was quaint, the kind of place where everyone knew everyone else. The locals were friendly enough, though I always felt like an outsider. I made friends with a few people, including my neighbor, Reuben Harker. Reuben was an old-timer, born and raised in the town. He had stories about everything, and I enjoyed listening to him talk about the history of the place. One evening, Reuben and I were sitting on my porch, drinking beers and watching the sun set over the mountains. The conversation turned to local legends, and Reuben started talking about the strange disappearances that had happened over the years. Gideon, you ever hear about the folks that went missing around these parts? He asked, his eyes narrowing. Can't say I have, Reuben, I replied, taking a swig of my beer. What happened to them? Well, it's a bit of a mystery. Every few years, someone just up and vanishes. No trace, no clues, nothing. The locals say it's the work of the werewolf, Reuben said, his voice dropping to a whisper as if the creature might be listening. I chuckled. A werewolf? Come on, Reuben. You expect me to believe that? Reuben shrugged. Believe what you want. But folks around here take it seriously. They say it's been happening for decades. My granddad even claimed to have seen it once. A hulking beast with glowing eyes and fangs like knives. Sounds like a campfire story to me, I said, trying to mask my unease with humor. But it's a good one, I'll give you that. Reuben gave me a long look. Just be careful, Gideon. This place has secrets, and some of them are better left alone. I laughed it off. But that night, I couldn't shake the feeling that Reuben's words held a kernel of truth. I chalked it up to an overactive imagination and went to bed, trying to put the thought of werewolves out of my mind. A few weeks later, I had a photography gig in a nearby town. I spent the day shooting and decided to take the long way home, hoping to catch some good shots of the landscape at dusk. The light was perfect, casting an ethereal glow over the rolling hills and dense forests. As I drove through a particularly remote stretch of road, my car started to sputter. Before I knew it, it had died completely, leaving me stranded in the middle of nowhere. Cursing my luck, I got out and popped the hood, but I didn't know the first thing about fixing cars. I was about to start walking when I heard something rustling in the woods nearby. I glanced around, suddenly aware of how isolated I was. The sun was dipping below the horizon, and shadows were creeping across the landscape. Hello? I called out, hoping it was just a deer or some other harmless animal. There was no response, but the rustling continued, getting closer. My heart started to race as I realized that whatever it was, it was heading straight for me. I backed away from the car, my eyes scanning the tree line. And then I saw it. At first, it was just a shadow, a dark shape moving between the trees. But as it emerged into the fading light, I got a good look at it. It was massive, at least seven feet tall, with long, shaggy fur and eyes that seemed to glow with an unnatural light. Its face was a twisted snarl of fangs and claws, more beast than man. I stood there, frozen in terror, as it started to move towards me. In a flash of instinct, I turned and ran, sprinting down the road as fast as I could. I could hear the creature behind me, its heavy footsteps pounding against the ground. I didn't dare look back, fear driving me forward. I stumbled upon a small cabin, its windows dark and shuttered. Without thinking, I ran to the door and pounded on it, hoping against hope that someone was home. The door creaked open, and an elderly woman peeked out. Please, you have to let me in, I gasped. There's something out there. The woman's eyes widened in fear and she pulled me inside, slamming the door shut behind me. What did you see? She asked, her voice trembling. A... Uh, a creature, I stammered. A werewolf. The woman's face went pale. It's come back, she whispered. We thought it was gone for good. What do you mean? I asked, trying to catch my breath. The werewolf. 
It's been hunting these woods for years. My husband went out one night to check on the livestock and never came back. I saw it myself once a long time ago. It's real, and it's dangerous. I looked around the cabin, noting the heavy wooden shutters and reinforced door. You've been preparing for this, haven't you? The woman nodded. We've all heard the stories, but most folks don't believe them. I've always been ready, just in case. We sat in silence, the weight of the situation sinking in. Outside, the night was eerily quiet. I could feel the tension in the air, a palpable sense of dread. Then, without warning, there was a loud crash. The door shook as something massive slammed against it. The woman grabbed a shotgun from the corner and handed it to me. Take this, she said. You're going to need it. I took the gun, my hands trembling. What about you? I've got another one, she said, brandishing a rifle. We'll make our stand here. The creature continued to batter the door, and I could see the wood starting to splinter. I braced myself, knowing that we didn't have much time. Finally, the door gave way, and the werewolf burst into the cabin. It was even more terrifying up close, its eyes blazing with a feral intensity. The woman fired first, the shot echoing through the cabin. The creature staggered but didn't go down. I aimed the shotgun and fired, the recoil nearly knocking me off my feet. The werewolf roared in pain, but it kept coming, its eyes fixed on me. I fired again and again, each shot chipping away at the monster's resolve. The woman kept shooting, her face set in grim determination. Together, we drove the creature back, each shot weakening it further. Finally, with one last, desperate lunge, it collapsed to the floor, its body twitching as it took its final breaths. We stood there, panting and exhausted, the cabin filled with the acrid smell of gunpowder. The woman lowered her rifle and looked at me. It's over, she said, her voice trembling. We did it. I nodded, feeling a wave of relief wash over me. The creature was dead, but the memory of that night would stay with me forever. In the aftermath, the town was abuzz with the news of the werewolf's death. People were skeptical at first, but the evidence was undeniable. The creature's body was taken away by authorities, and the disappearances stopped. Life slowly returned to normal, but I could never shake the feeling that something dark still lingered in those woods. I moved away a few months later, needing to put as much distance between myself and that place as possible. I still think about it sometimes, the terror and the adrenaline of that night. I've told my story to a few people, but most of them just laugh it off as a tall tale. But I know what I saw, and I know what we did. The woman, whose name I later learned was Edith, became a bit of a local legend herself. She stayed in that cabin, always prepared, always vigilant. We kept in touch for a while, sharing a bond forged in the heat of battle. And as for me, I kept on with my photography, always with an eye on the shadows, always wary of what might be lurking just out of sight. Because once you've faced a monster, you never forget, and you never stop looking over your shoulder. So that's my story. Believe it or don't, it makes no difference to me. But if you ever find yourself in a small town with a history of disappearances, keep your wits about you. You never know what might be waiting in the dark. My name is Orson Keen, and this is a story about a time when things went very wrong for me and a few others. It was in 2008, in a small, almost forgotten town in Wyoming called Encampment. I was working as a mechanic at the time, which suited me just fine. I liked working with my hands, fixing things, getting dirty, and there wasn't much that I couldn't fix. Encampment isn't the kind of place you'd find on a map unless you were looking for it. It's quiet, surrounded by mountains, and has a population of just under 500 people. People there know each other, for better or worse. For me, it was mostly for the better. I lived alone, didn't have many friends, but I got along well with my neighbor Tom, who ran the local diner. 
We'd often spend our evenings talking about nothing in particular over a couple of beers. One evening, Tom told me about a series of disappearances that had been happening in the surrounding forests. Now, Wyoming has its share of missing hikers and hunters, but this was different. People who lived in the town their whole lives, who knew the land like the back of their hand, were vanishing without a trace. Tom's cousin, Lyle, was one of them. Tom had a wild theory that something was hunting people. I laughed it off, said he was spending too much time watching those ghost hunting shows. Life carried on as usual until one evening when I was at Tom's diner. It was late. The place was empty except for us. We were watching some old western on the TV when suddenly the lights flickered. Tom and I exchanged a glance, shrugged it off, and continued watching. The flickering stopped, and we forgot about it until Tom went to close up and found the back door wide open. He swore he had locked it. Maybe it was the wind, I said, but we both knew better. That door had a heavy latch. No wind was going to open it. Tom decided to stay over at my place that night. We didn't talk about it, but I knew he was spooked. I didn't mind the company. The next day, news came that another person had gone missing. This time it was Edna, an elderly lady who lived alone on the outskirts of town. Her place was found empty, door wide open, a pot of stew still simmering on the stove. No signs of struggle, no footprints, nothing. It was like she had just walked out and disappeared into thin air. I started paying more attention to the stories Tom was telling me. We were both on edge. People in town were whispering, making up their own theories. Some said it was a wild animal, others talked about ghosts. A few even suggested there was a killer among us. One night, I couldn't sleep. It was around midnight, and I decided to take a walk. It was cold, the kind of cold that bites through your jacket. As I walked past Edna's house, I saw something move in the shadows. I froze, squinting to see better, but there was nothing. I shook it off as my imagination turned around and went back home. A few days later, I had a late-night visitor. Tom banged on my door, pale and shaking. He said he had seen something in the woods behind his diner. I grabbed my shotgun. It wasn't loaded, but it made us feel better, and we headed out. We didn't see anything that night, but we both felt like we were being watched. The disappearances continued, and the town was in a panic. People were locking their doors, kids weren't allowed to play outside, and anyone who could leave did. Those of us who stayed were left with a sense of dread. One evening, I was working late at the garage when I heard a noise outside. It sounded like a faint cry for help. I grabbed my flashlight and went to investigate. The sound was coming from the woods. Against my better judgment, I ventured in. I kept walking, calling out, but the cries stopped. Suddenly, there was silence. I turned to head back when I saw it. A figure, tall and gaunt, with eyes that seemed to glow in the dark. It moved fast, too fast for me to react. I stumbled back, falling over a log. By the time I got up, it was gone. I ran back to the garage, locked the doors, and called Tom. He came over, and we spent the night trying to make sense of what I saw. We both agreed it was something not natural, but what it was, we couldn't say. The next day, Sheriff Arnold came by. He was a tough guy, not easily rattled, but even he looked worried. He asked us to keep quiet about what we saw, said it would only cause more panic. He told us he was forming a search party to look for the missing people and asked if we'd join. We agreed. It wasn't like we had much of a choice. The search party consisted of me, Tom, Sheriff Arnold, and a few other townsfolk. We combed the woods for days, finding nothing but more questions. One of the guys, Bill, swore he saw something similar to what I described, but no one else did. Then, one night, it happened. We were camping out in the woods, taking turns keeping watch. It was my shift when I heard rustling in the bushes. I pointed my flashlight and saw it again, those glowing eyes. Before I could react, it charged at us. The camp erupted into chaos. People were shouting, firing their guns blindly into the dark. I managed to get a clear shot, but it didn't seem to do any good. The thing was fast, too fast. By the time the chaos died down, Bill was gone. 
We searched for him until dawn but found no trace. Sheriff Arnold decided it was too dangerous to continue and called off the search. We headed back to town, defeated. Back in encampment, things got worse. More people went missing, and those who remained were too scared to leave their homes. Tom and I decided to take matters into our own hands. We armed ourselves with whatever we could find and set out to hunt the thing. We spent days tracking it, following the faintest of trails. Finally, we found its lair, a cave deep in the woods. We could smell it before we saw it, a foul stench of decay. We entered cautiously, flashlights cutting through the darkness. The cave was littered with bones, some animal, some unmistakably human. Then we saw it. The thing was hunched over, gnawing on something. It looked up, eyes glowing, and let out a noise that sent chills down my spine. It charged at us. Tom fired first, hitting it in the shoulder. I followed, aiming for its head. It staggered but didn't go down. It lashed out, knocking Tom to the ground. I fired again, emptying my gun into it until it finally collapsed. We stood there panting, staring at the lifeless body. It looked human but twisted, deformed. We dragged it out of the cave and burned it, not knowing what else to do. The disappearances stopped after that. Life and encampment slowly returned to normal, but the town was never quite the same. People who left never came back, and those who stayed never spoke about what happened. Tom and I kept our secret, telling ourselves it was for the best. We never talked about that night, but every now and then, I catch him looking at the woods with a haunted look in his eyes. We survived, but we weren't the same. I still work at the garage, fixing cars, living my life. But every time I hear a noise in the woods, I wonder if there's something else out there, waiting. So that's my story. It's not a happy one, but it's the truth. I guess some things are better left buried in the past, forgotten like the town of Encampment. But sometimes, late at night, I can still see those glowing eyes and wonder if we really killed it, or just made it angry. My name is Zeke Larkins, and I gotta tell you about the wildest thing that ever happened to me. It was back in 2005, and I was just a regular guy living in this little town called Riverton in Arkansas. Riverton was the kind of place where everybody knew everybody. I worked at the local hardware store, nothing fancy, but it paid the bills. I used to fish on weekends and play cards with the fellas at the VFW. Life was simple and predictable, just the way I liked it. One Saturday, my buddy Vern asked if I wanted to join him for a little fishing trip up at Mill Creek. Vern was a good guy, always cracking jokes and making light of things. He had this beat-up old truck and we piled in with our gear and a cooler full of beer. Mill Creek was about a half-hour drive into the woods, a perfect spot away from everything. We got there around noon. The sky was clear, and it felt like a perfect day to catch some fish. We set up near this big oak tree by the water, casting our lines and talking about nothing in particular. The creek was peaceful, the kind of place where you could just lose track of time. Around three in the afternoon, we heard something rustling in the bushes across the creek, at first, we thought it was a deer or maybe a raccoon, but then it sounded like something bigger. Vern, being the joker he was, said, Maybe it's Bigfoot, Zeke. Better watch out. We laughed it off, but the noise didn't stop. I decided to check it out. I crossed the creek on some stepping stones and made my way toward the bushes. As I got closer, I saw something moving behind the trees. It was big, really big. I figured it was a bear but there was something off about it. Bears don't usually hang out around here, and this thing was moving on two legs, not four. Before I could get a better look, Vern called out, Hey, Zeke, you see anything? I turned to yell back, Not yet. But when I looked back, the thing was gone. Just like that, it disappeared into the woods. I shrugged it off, figuring maybe my eyes were playing tricks on me. We fished for another couple of hours, but that feeling of being watched never went away. As the sun started to set, we packed up our gear and headed back to the truck. The drive home was quiet, both of us lost in our thoughts. 
A few days later, I was back at work when this guy named Eddie came in. Eddie was one of those fellas who liked to spin tall tales, but he looked genuinely spooked this time. He told me he'd been hiking near Mill Creek and saw something strange. Said it was like a huge, hairy man, but with these freaky yellow eyes. He swore it was real, but no one believed him. That got me thinking about what I saw, or thought I saw, that day. I started talking to folks around town, and turns out a few others had seen strange things near Mill Creek, too. But it wasn't just sightings. People started going missing. First, it was a couple of hikers. Then a local kid named Jimmy who'd gone camping with his friends. Jimmy was a good kid, never got into trouble, so when he didn't come back, folks really started to worry. The sheriff, old man Doyle, tried to keep things calm, but you could see he was rattled. Riverton was a quiet town. We didn't have the kind of trouble that needed more than a couple of deputies. But now people were scared, and with good reason. Missing kids, strange sightings. It was like something out of a bad movie. One night, I was sitting on my porch, nursing a beer and thinking about all this. My neighbor Hank came over. Hank was a no-nonsense kind of guy, ex-military and tough as nails. He sat down and said, Zeke, I think we gotta do something about this. Can't just sit around waiting for the sheriff to figure it out. Hank suggested we form a search party, go out to Mill Creek, and see if we could find any clues about what was going on. I agreed, and we rounded up a few more guys from the VFW, Vern, Eddie, and a couple of others. We figured we'd go out at first light. We met at Hank's place the next morning. Hank had a couple of rifles and a shotgun, just in case. Vern had a big flashlight, and Eddie brought his hunting knife. We weren't looking for trouble, but we weren't about to go unprepared. We drove out to Mill Creek and started our search near the spot where Vern and I had been fishing. The woods were eerily quiet, the kind of quiet that makes your skin crawl. We spread out, moving slowly, eyes peeled for anything unusual. After a couple of hours, Eddie found something. It was a piece of torn fabric, looked like it might have come from a shirt. There were also some strange tracks in the mud, like nothing I'd ever seen before. Big, with claw marks. Whatever made those tracks wasn't human. We followed the tracks deeper into the woods. The trees grew thicker, and the light dimmer. It felt like we were walking into another world, a place where the rules we knew didn't apply. After what felt like miles, we came to a clearing. That's when we saw it. Standing there, just at the edge of the trees, was this creature. It was tall, at least seven feet, covered in thick, dark hair. Its eyes glowed yellow in the dim light, and its hands ended in these long, curved claws. It looked like something out of a nightmare. Hank raised his rifle, but the creature moved faster than anything that size should. It let out this low, rumbling noise, and before we knew it, it was on us. Hank fired a shot, but it barely seemed to phase the thing. It swiped at him with one of those claws, and Hank went down hard. We scattered, trying to regroup. Vern and I ran one way, Eddie and the others went another. I could hear the creature crashing through the woods behind us. It was fast. Too fast. Vern tripped over a root, and before I could help him, the creature was on him. It slashed at him, and Vern screamed. The sound was something I'll never forget. I kept running, heart pounding in my chest. I didn't know where I was going, just away from that thing. I burst out of the woods and onto the road, nearly getting hit by a passing car. The driver, a woman named Karen, stopped and helped me. I told her about Vern and the others, and she called the sheriff. By the time Doyle and his deputies got out there, it was too late. They found Vern's body, or what was left of it, and some blood trails leading deeper into the woods. There was no sign of the creature, and no sign of Hank or Eddie. The town was in shock. Sheriff Doyle tried to keep things under wraps, but rumors spread fast. Some folks believed the stories. Others thought it was all a hoax. But I knew what I saw. Vern was dead, and Hank and Eddie were missing. Doyle organized another search, bigger this time, with more armed men. They scoured the woods for days, but found nothing. It was like the creature had vanished, leaving no trace behind. Life in Riverton changed after that. People stopped going into the woods. 
The fishing trips and camping outings that were once a staple of our lives became distant memories. Parents kept a closer watch on their kids, and folks started locking their doors at night. I moved away a few months later. Couldn't stand the memories, the looks from people who still weren't sure if they believed me. I settled in a small town in Missouri, got a job at another hardware store, and tried to put it all behind me. But every so often, I'd think about Vern and Hank and Eddie and that thing in the woods. Years passed, and Riverton faded into the background of my life. But the memories never really left. I kept in touch with Karen, the woman who'd helped me that night. She stayed in Riverton, said things eventually went back to normal, but there were always whispers about what happened. One day I got a call from her. She sounded shaken, said there'd been another sighting, a hiker who'd seen something big and hairy near Mill Creek. She asked if I'd come back, help look into it. I told her I was done with that place, but she sounded desperate. Against my better judgment, I agreed. Drove back to Riverton, feeling a mix of dread and curiosity. The town looked the same, but I felt like a stranger. Met up with Karen and a few others, including Sheriff Doyle, who was looking a lot older these days. We headed back to Mill Creek, the place that had haunted my dreams for so long. It felt like walking into a bad memory. We spread out, searching the area where the hiker had reported the sighting. It didn't take long before we found the tracks. Same as before, big and clawed. We followed them, hearts pounding, senses on high alert. The sun was setting, casting long shadows through the trees. Just as we reached the clearing, we heard it. That same rumbling noise, low and menacing. The creature stepped out of the shadows, just as terrifying as I remembered. But this time, we were ready. Doyle and his deputies opened fire, the sound echoing through the woods. The creature roared, a sound that shook me to my core. It charged at us, but we held our ground. Bullets tore into its hide, and finally, it went down. The relief was palpable, but short-lived. As we approached, we realized this was just one of them. The woods around us came alive with movement, more creatures stepping into the clearing. We didn't stand a chance. The creatures tore through us like we were nothing. I saw Doyle go down, followed by Karen. I fought with everything I had, but it wasn't enough. The last thing I remember was the sight of those eyes, closing in on me. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed. They told me I'd been found on the road just like before. No sign of the creatures, no bodies, nothing. It was like a nightmare that wouldn't end. I left Riverton for good after that, moved to a big city, where the only monsters were the ones you read about in the news. But sometimes, late at night, I still hear those noises, and I wonder if they're still out there, waiting. So that's my story. Believe it or not, it's the truth. I lost good friends to those things, and I'll never forget what I saw. If you ever find yourself near Mill Creek, do yourself a favor and stay away. Some things are better left alone. My name is Ezekiel Mahone, but you can call me Zeke. I've always loved the outdoors, hiking through the trails of my small hometown in western Pennsylvania. I grew up here, learned to ride a bike on the same streets, and fished in the same creeks. My dad, a park ranger, taught me everything I know about nature. He used to say, the forest is our backyard, and every trail is a hallway. He had a way with words, always making things sound more poetic than they really were. I've never been one to shy away from a challenge. After high school, I did a stint in the army, then came back home to work at the local hardware store. It's not glamorous, but it pays the bills. I'd often spend my weekends exploring new trails or finding spots where the fish were biting. It was on one of these weekend outings that everything changed. It was early September, a time when the leaves just start to hint at the coming fall, and the air gets a bit crisper in the mornings. I decided to explore an area I hadn't been to in years, Deep Creek Woods. The place had a reputation for being haunted, a story passed down from generation to generation. I never believed in that stuff, but the place did have an eerie feeling to it. I packed my bag with the usual, water, a couple of sandwiches, my fishing gear, and a flashlight, just in case. 
As I walked deeper into the woods, I noticed how quiet it was. No birds singing, no rustling in the bushes, just silence. I shrugged it off, thinking maybe it was just one of those days. I found a nice spot by the creek and set up my fishing rod. Hours passed with nothing but the occasional tug on the line. I decided to head back when I noticed the sun was beginning to set. I packed up my things and started walking back. But something felt off. The path I took seemed different, less familiar. I must have wandered off the main trail without realizing it. I pulled out my flashlight and clicked it on. The beam cut through the darkness, illuminating the dense trees around me. I kept walking, hoping to find something familiar. Suddenly, I heard a rustling behind me. I whipped around, shining the flashlight in the direction of the noise. Nothing. Just trees and shadows. Get a grip, Zeke. I muttered to myself and kept moving. The rustling came again, this time louder. It wasn't just the wind. Something was out there. I quickened my pace, the beam of my flashlight bouncing with each step. I could feel my heartbeat in my throat, my breath coming in shallow gasps. Then I saw it, a pair of glowing eyes staring back at me from the darkness. My heart nearly stopped. I aimed the flashlight at the eyes, and what I saw was something out of a nightmare. It was a creature, standing on two legs but covered in fur, with a face that was a grotesque mix of human and wolf. Its eyes were a sickly yellow, and its mouth was twisted into a snarl, revealing sharp, glistening teeth. I stood frozen, unable to move, my mind racing to make sense of what I was seeing. Before I could react, the creature lunged at me. I threw my backpack at it and ran. The woods were a blur as I sprinted through them, branches scratching at my face and arms. I didn't dare look back. I could hear the creature behind me crashing through the underbrush. I stumbled, falling hard onto the ground, but quickly scrambled to my feet and kept running. I burst out of the woods and into a clearing, gasping for air. I saw the lights of a cabin in the distance and made a beeline for it. I pounded on the door, shouting for help. An older man, probably in his sixties, opened the door, looking at me with a mixture of concern and confusion. Please, let me in, I shouted. He stepped aside, and I rushed in, slamming the door behind me. I quickly locked it and leaned against it, trying to catch my breath. What's going on? The man asked. His name was Walter Finch, a retired cop who'd moved to the woods for some peace and quiet. I quickly told him what I'd seen, expecting him to laugh or call me crazy. But he didn't. I've heard stories about that thing, Walter said, his face grim. People go missing around here every few years, and the ones who come back are never the same. They talk about a creature, just like you described. We spent the next few hours barricading the cabin, making sure every door and window was secure. Walter handed me a shotgun, and we sat in the living room, waiting. The silence was thick, punctuated only by our breathing. Around midnight, we heard it, a low, menacing growl outside the cabin. The creature was there, circling us, testing the barriers. We stayed quiet, hoping it would lose interest and go away. But it didn't. It started clawing at the door, the sound of wood splintering filling the room. Walter and I exchanged a glance. If it gets in, we don't stand a chance, he whispered. I nodded, gripping the shotgun tighter. The creature's growling grew louder, more aggressive. It was only a matter of time before it broke through. The door finally gave way and the creature burst into the cabin. Walter fired a shot, hitting it in the shoulder. The creature howled in pain but didn't stop. It lunged at Walter, knocking him to the ground. I fired the shotgun, hitting it in the chest. The creature staggered but kept coming. I fired again, aiming for its head this time. The shot connected, and the creature fell to the floor, motionless. I stood there, shaking, the adrenaline coursing through my veins. Walter groaned, and I rushed to his side. He was alive, but barely. The creature had mauled him pretty badly. Hang in there, Walter, I said, trying to keep him conscious. We'll get you out of here. I grabbed my phone and dialed 911, praying for a signal. Miraculously, it went through. 
I told the dispatcher our location and what had happened. They assured me help was on the way. While we waited, I kept pressure on Walter's wounds, talking to him to keep him awake. The creature's body lay nearby, a gruesome reminder of what we'd just survived. Walter's breathing was shallow, and I knew we didn't have much time. The paramedics arrived just in time, rushing Walter to the hospital. The police took my statement, but I could tell they didn't believe me. They chalked it up to a bear attack, despite my insistence otherwise. They took the creature's body away, promising to investigate, but I never heard anything more about it. Walter pulled through, but he was never the same. The encounter left him scarred, both physically and mentally. He moved away from the woods, seeking the safety of the city. I stayed in town, but I never went back to Deep Creek Woods. I still think about that night, about the creature and the terror it brought. Some nights, I wake up in a cold sweat, the sound of its growling echoing in my ears. I don't know what it was or where it came from, but I do know one thing. It was real, and it was out there. Life went on, but the memory of that night never faded. I became more cautious, more aware of my surroundings. I shared my story with a few close friends, but most of them thought I was just trying to scare them. Only a handful believed me, having heard similar stories from their own grandparents. Years passed, and the story of the creature became a local legend, something parents would use to scare their kids into staying close to home. But for me, it was more than just a story. It was a reminder of the darkness that can exist in the world, lurking just beyond the edges of our understanding. I've tried to move on, to live my life without fear. But every now and then, when I'm out in the woods, I can't help but feel like I'm being watched. Maybe it's just my imagination. Or maybe there's more out there than we'll ever know. One thing's for sure. If you ever find yourself in Deep Creek Woods, be careful. Stick to the trails, keep your wits about you, and if you hear something rustling in the darkness, don't wait to find out what it is. Run. Run, and don't look back. Because you never know what might be watching from the shadows, waiting for its next chance to strike. My name is Arlo Tierney, and I'm here to tell you about the worst night of my life. This happened back in 1993, when I was just getting started as a freelance photographer. I lived in a small apartment in Tullytown, Pennsylvania, not far from where I grew up. Life was good, mostly. My girlfriend Melina and I were pretty serious. We spent most of our weekends driving around the countryside, looking for interesting places to shoot and relax. This story isn't about Melina, though. It's about a night that still haunts me to this day. It was late October, and the air was getting crisp. i just finished a shoot in Bristol, not far from my place, and decided to take a detour on my way home. I'd heard about an abandoned factory out in the sticks, a perfect spot for some gritty, atmospheric shots. I had an old Canon AE-1 that I loved using for these kinds of scenes. Anyway, I didn't tell Melina where I was going. She'd have just worried, and I didn't think it was a big deal. Boy, was I wrong. The place was a real dump, covered in graffiti and falling apart. But it had character, you know? As I was setting up my gear, I heard some rustling. Figured it was just raccoons or something. This place was pretty isolated. I snapped a few shots, checking the light and angles, when I noticed a faint glow coming from one of the factory buildings. At first, I thought it was a trick of the light. But then I saw it again. Definitely a light. Flickering like a candle or a flashlight. Being the curious idiot that I am, I decided to check it out. I grabbed my camera and headed toward the building. The door was hanging off its hinges, creaking like a bad horror movie sound effect. Inside, it was dark and musty, with debris scattered everywhere. The light was coming from a room at the far end. As I got closer, I heard voices. Low, murmuring voices. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but they didn't sound friendly. I peeked through a crack in the door. There were three guys standing around a makeshift altar muttering some kind of chant. I couldn't see their faces clearly, but they were dressed in ragged clothes and looked like they hadn't bathed in weeks. This wasn't some harmless hobo gathering. It felt... 
sinister. Before I could process what was happening, one of them turned and saw me. He yelled something and the other two spun around. I bolted. I didn't look back, just ran as fast as I could toward the exit. I could hear them chasing me, their footsteps pounding on the cracked concrete floor. I made it out of the building and into the open, but I could still hear them behind me. I ducked into a thicket of trees and kept running, trying to put as much distance between us as possible. I stumbled through the woods for what felt like hours, tripping over roots and scraping my hands on branches. Eventually I found a dirt road and followed it until I came across an old farmhouse. The place looked deserted, but I was desperate. I pounded on the door, shouting for help. After what seemed like forever, the door creaked open and an old man peered out. His name was Vernon, and he looked like he'd seen better days, but he let me in. I told Vernon what had happened, and he listened without interrupting. When I finished, he shook his head and muttered something about them cult folks causing trouble around these parts. He offered to drive me back to town, and I gratefully accepted. We got into his beat-up pickup and drove in silence. The roads were dark and winding, and I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. We reached Tullytown without incident, and Vernon dropped me off at my apartment. I thanked him and hurried inside, locking the door behind me. I called Melina and told her everything. She insisted on coming over, and I was glad for the company. She stayed with me that night, and we didn't sleep much. I kept hearing those footsteps, those voices, echoing in my head. The next day, I went to the police. They took my statement, but there wasn't much they could do. The factory was out of their jurisdiction, and without more evidence, they couldn't launch an investigation. I felt helpless. Over the next few days, I tried to put the whole thing behind me. I buried myself in work, but the memory of that night lingered. A week later, I got a call from Vernon. He sounded shaken, said he'd seen something in the woods near his farmhouse, something that didn't belong there. He asked if I could come and take a look. I hesitated, but I couldn't ignore his plea. Melina wanted to come with me, but I told her to stay put. I didn't want to risk her safety. When I arrived at Vernon's place, he led me into the woods. We walked in silence, the only sound our footsteps crunching on the fallen leaves. After about half an hour, we reached a clearing. In the center was a large, flat stone, stained with what looked like dried blood. Vernon said he'd found it the day after I'd been there, along with strange symbols carved into the trees around the clearing. As we stood there, I felt a chill run down my spine. This was no coincidence. The cult, or whatever they were, had been here. They'd performed some kind of ritual, and now they knew I was on to them. I took some photos of the clearing and the symbols, but I knew it wasn't enough. We needed more evidence, something concrete to take to the authorities. We decided to stake out the area that night. Vernon had an old hunting rifle and I had my camera. We hid in the trees, waiting for any sign of movement. The hours dragged on, and I could feel the tension building. Around midnight, we heard footsteps. Three figures emerged from the shadows, carrying torches. It was the same three guys I'd seen in the factory. They approached the stone, and one of them began chanting. The other two stood guard, their eyes scanning the trees. Vernon and I stayed as still as possible, barely breathing. The ritual went on for what felt like forever. Then, just as suddenly as they'd appeared, they were gone. We waited another hour before daring to move. I took more photos and gathered what evidence I could. The next day, we went back to the police. This time, they couldn't ignore us. With the photos and Vernon's testimony, they launched an investigation. It took a few days, but they eventually raided the factory. The cult members were arrested, and the place was shut down. It turned out they were part of a larger network, performing rituals and sacrifices in secluded locations across the state. In the end, they were charged with multiple counts of murder and kidnapping. The trial was long and harrowing, but they were convicted and sentenced to life in prison. I'd like to say that was the end of it, that I could go back to my normal life. But the truth is, that night changed me. I'm more cautious now, more aware of the darkness that lurks in the world. Melina and I eventually got married, 
and we moved to a different town. We have two kids now, and I've made a decent living as a photographer. But every now and then, I think back to that night in the factory, and I wonder what might have happened if I hadn't taken that detour. It's a reminder that sometimes, curiosity can lead you down a dark and dangerous path. Years later, I heard about a similar incident in a neighboring state. Another abandoned building, another group of people performing rituals. It made me wonder if the cult was truly gone, or if they'd just moved on to another place. I guess I'll never know for sure. But one thing's certain. I'll never forget the fear I felt that night. And I'll always be grateful for Vernon's help. Without him, I might not be here to tell this story. In the end, we all have our own battles to fight, our own demons to face. Mine just happened to be more literal than most. But I've learned to live with it, to carry on despite the fear. Because in the end, life goes on, and we have to find a way to move forward, even if the shadows of the past still linger. My name is Gordon Tilbury, and this happened to me back in 1997, in a little-known place called Edgewood, Texas. I was a bit of a drifter back then, traveling from town to town, doing odd jobs to make ends meet. I wasn't looking for trouble, but trouble sure knew how to find me. Edgewood was a quiet, out-of-the-way town with a population just shy of a thousand. It was the kind of place where everyone knew everyone, and strangers were noticed immediately. I had been in town for about a week picking up work at the local auto shop, owned by a grizzled old man named Frank Burkett. Frank didn't talk much, but he paid cash and didn't ask questions, which suited me just fine. One evening, after a long day of changing tires and tuning engines, I decided to head over to the only bar in town, the Rusty Nail. It was a small, dimly lit joint with a handful of regulars nursing their drinks. I ordered a beer and took a seat at the bar, making small talk with the bartender a young woman named Ellie. You're new around here, she said, her eyes narrowing slightly as she wiped down the counter. Yeah, just passing through, I replied, taking a sip of my beer. Name's Gordon. Nice to meet you, Gordon. I'm Ellie. Just a heads up, we don't get many newcomers in Edgewood. Folks around here can be a bit... suspicious. I chuckled. Noted. I just need a place to crash for a while, earn some money, and then I'll be on my way. As the night wore on, a few more patrons drifted in, including a burly man named Cyrus Vandiver. He was a local legend of sorts, known for his wild tales and tendency to get into fights when he had one too many. Cyrus was already three sheets to the wind when he stumbled over to where I was sitting. You the new guy working for Frank? He slurred, his eyes bloodshot and unfocused. That's me, I said, trying to keep my tone friendly. Well, let me give you some advice, buddy. You stay out of the woods, you hear me? There are things out there you don't want to mess with. I raised an eyebrow. What kind of things? Cyrus leaned in closer, his breath reeking of whiskey. There are stories about people going missing, animals torn to shreds. Some folks say there's a creature out there, a werewolf. I couldn't help but laugh. A werewolf? Seriously? Cyrus didn't seem amused. You can laugh all you want, but I've seen it. Big as a bear, with teeth like knives. You stay out of the woods, or you might end up like those poor souls who never came back. Ellie shot me a sympathetic look. Don't mind him, Gordon. Cyrus likes to tell tall tales when he's drunk. I nodded, but Cyrus's words stuck with me. I wasn't one to believe in monsters, but there was something about the intensity in his eyes that made me uneasy. A few days later, I found myself in need of some extra cash. Frank mentioned that old man Henderson, who lived on the outskirts of town, needed help fixing his tractor. Henderson was known for being a bit of a recluse, but he paid well, so I decided to take the job. The Henderson place was about five miles out of town, surrounded by dense woods. As I walked up the dirt driveway, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I chalked it up to Cyrus's drunken ramblings and knocked on the door. Henderson, a gaunt man in his seventies, greeted me with a nod. You must be the mechanic. Frank said you'd be coming. 
That's right. I'm Gordon, I said, extending my hand. He shook it briefly. The tractor's in the barn. Follow me. We worked in relative silence, the only sounds being the clink of tools and the occasional grunt of effort. As the sun began to set, casting long shadows across the yard, Henderson suddenly tensed. You best be heading back to town soon, he said, his voice tight. It's not safe to be out here after dark. I glanced at him, confused. What do you mean? He hesitated, then shook his head. Just trust me on this. Get back to town before nightfall. I finished the job as quickly as I could and started the long walk back to Edgewood. The woods on either side of the road seemed to close in around me as darkness fell. I quickened my pace, the crunch of gravel under my boots the only sound in the oppressive silence. Halfway back I heard a rustling in the bushes to my left. I stopped, straining to see in the dim light. For a moment there was nothing, and then I saw it. A pair of glowing eyes staring at me from the underbrush. My heart pounded in my chest as I took a step back. The creature emerged slowly, and my breath caught in my throat. It was massive, standing on two legs but covered in coarse, dark fur. Its eyes gleamed with a predatory hunger, and its snout was lined with sharp, glistening teeth. I turned and ran, my mind racing. This couldn't be real. Werewolves didn't exist. But the sound of heavy footsteps behind me said otherwise. I could hear its ragged breathing, feel its presence closing in. I stumbled and fell, the creature looming over me in an instant. Its jaws snapped inches from my face, and I scrambled to my feet, desperate to escape. As I ran, I remembered the old hunting cabin Frank had mentioned once, just off the road. I veered towards it, praying it was still there. Bursting through the door, I slammed it shut and bolted it, my chest heaving. The creature crashed against the wood, snarling and scratching. I grabbed an old shotgun from the wall, checking the chamber. It was loaded. I braced myself as the door splintered. When the creature forced its way in, I fired. The blast echoed in the small space, and the werewolf staggered back, howling in pain. I fired again, and it collapsed, twitching, before finally going still. I stood there, shaking, the gun still clenched in my hands. After what felt like an eternity, I slowly approached the body. It was no longer a werewolf, but a man, his lifeless eyes staring up at me. The transformation was grotesque, the fur receding, leaving behind blood and torn flesh. I knew I had to get back to town, to tell someone what had happened. But who would believe me? I buried the body behind the cabin, hoping it would stay hidden long enough for me to figure out what to do next. When I finally made it back to Edgewood, I went straight to Frank's place. He opened the door, taking one look at my disheveled state and the blood on my clothes. What the hell happened to you? He asked, his brow furrowing. I took a deep breath. Frank, you need to hear this, and you need to believe me. I recounted the events of the night, every detail. Frank listened, his expression growing grimmer with each word. When I finished, he let out a long sigh. I knew there was something out there, he said quietly. I've heard the stories, but I never thought, damn. What do we do now? I asked, my voice barely a whisper. Frank rubbed his chin thoughtfully. We keep this quiet, for one. If word gets out, it'll cause a panic. We'll need to figure out who that man was, and if there are more like him. Over the next few days, Frank and I worked to piece together the identity of the man I had killed. It wasn't easy, but eventually we found out he was a drifter, much like myself, who had come to Edgewood a few months prior. His name was Elwood Granger, and he had no family or connections that anyone knew of. We kept our secret, burying the truth along with the body. Life in Edgewood returned to its quiet routine, but I could never shake the feeling of unease. Every rustle in the woods... Every shadow in the corner of my eye reminded me of that night. I stayed in Edgewood for a few more months, helping Frank and trying to put the pieces of my life back together. Eventually, the road called to me again, and I moved on, leaving the town and its dark secret behind. Years later, I still think about that night. 
about the creature in the woods and the man it became. I wonder if there are more out there, hiding in the shadows, waiting for their chance to strike. And I can't help but feel a chill run down my spine, knowing that some secrets are better left buried. My name is Everett Wickersham, and this happened to me in 2003. I'm a pretty ordinary guy, really. Grew up in a small town in Idaho, working on my family's farm until I left for college. I ended up in Arizona, studying agricultural science. You'd think I'd have had enough of fields and crops, but it's what I knew. After college, I took a job managing a large cattle ranch in a small, lesser-known town called Kingman. Kingman's one of those places you only find if you're really looking for it. It's tucked away surrounded by vast stretches of desert and mountains. Now, managing a ranch is no easy task, but it's the kind of work that keeps you grounded. You're up before dawn and in bed well after sunset. The land and the animals need constant attention. I got to know the folks in town pretty well. The locals were a mixed bunch, old families who'd been there for generations and a few newcomers looking for a quieter life. One evening, I was sitting on the porch of my small ranch house, sipping a cold beer. The sky was painted with a fiery sunset, and the heat of the day was finally starting to give way to a cooler breeze. I remember feeling content. Then my phone rang. It was Charlie, one of the ranch hands. He sounded worried. Everett, you gotta come down to the east pasture, he said. Something's not right with the cattle. I sighed setting my beer down and grabbing my hat. What's going on, Charlie? It's hard to explain. Just get down here. I drove out to the pasture, the tires of my old truck kicking up dust. When I got there, Charlie was standing by the fence, looking pale. He pointed to a spot in the field. I grabbed a flashlight and walked over. What I saw made my stomach churn. A few cattle were lying dead, their bodies torn open. I'd seen animal attacks before, but this was different. The wounds were jagged, almost like something had clawed them apart. What the hell did this? I muttered. Charlie shook his head. I don't know, boss. Never seen anything like it. We checked the perimeter, but there were no signs of any intruder. No tracks. No nothing. It was unsettling, to say the least. We decided to move the rest of the herd to a safer location and keep a close watch. That night, I barely slept. My mind kept replaying the scene over and over. What could have done that to those cattle? I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. The next few days were uneventful. We kept a close watch on the herd and everything seemed fine. Then, one night, it happened again. More cattle dead, same brutal injuries. This time, I called the sheriff. Sheriff Tom Garrison was a grizzled old man who'd seen his fair share of strange things in his years on the job, but even he was baffled. Everett, I don't know what to tell you, he said, scratching his head. We'll keep an eye out, but without any tracks or evidence, it's hard to say what we're dealing with here. I felt a creeping sense of dread. I knew I had to figure out what was going on before more cattle were lost, or worse, someone got hurt. I decided to set up some trail cameras around the perimeter of the pasture, hoping to catch whatever was responsible. A few nights later, I was reviewing the footage from the cameras when I saw something that made my blood run cold. There, in the grainy black and white video, was a figure moving through the pasture. It was tall, hunched over, with long, gangly limbs. It moved with a strange, almost animalistic grace. I couldn't make out any details, but it was enough to confirm my worst fears. This wasn't a coyote or a mountain lion. This was something else. I showed the footage to the sheriff, but he was skeptical. Could be a drifter, someone passing through, he said. Tom, you saw the footage. That thing isn't human, I insisted. He sighed. Look, Everett, I'll keep a closer watch, but there's only so much we can do. Just be careful, all right? I nodded but I knew I couldn't just sit back and wait. I had to take matters into my own hands. I armed myself with a rifle and a flashlight, determined to catch whatever was preying on my cattle. 
Charlie and a couple of the other ranch hands volunteered to help. We set up a watch, taking shifts throughout the night. One night, while on watch, I heard a rustling in the brush. My heart pounded as I raised my rifle, scanning the darkness with my flashlight. The beam caught a glimpse of something moving, something big. It darted away before I could get a clear look, but I knew I was close. Did you see that? Charlie whispered, his voice trembling. Yeah, I replied. Stay close. We're going after it. We moved through the brush, following the sounds. My pulse was racing, adrenaline pumping through my veins. Then, we came to a clearing, and there it was. Standing in the moonlight was a creature unlike anything I'd ever seen. It was tall, covered in matted fur, with glowing eyes that seemed to pierce right through me. It let out a low, guttural sound that made my skin crawl. For a moment I was frozen, unable to move or speak. Then, instinct kicked in. I raised my rifle and fired. The shot echoed through the night and the creature let out a howl of pain. It turned and fled into the darkness, leaving a trail of blood behind. We followed the blood trail, but it eventually disappeared, leaving us with more questions than answers. Over the next few days, we found more cattle dead, but the attacks seemed to lessen. It was as if the creature had been scared off, at least for now. Life slowly returned to normal, but I couldn't shake the feeling that we hadn't seen the last of whatever that thing was. The memory of those glowing eyes haunted me, a constant reminder that there are things in this world we can't explain. A few weeks later I was in town, grabbing supplies, when I overheard a couple of locals talking about strange sightings in the area. They mentioned seeing a large, wolf-like creature near their properties. I couldn't help but wonder if it was the same thing that had attacked my cattle. That night I sat on my porch, staring out into the darkness. I knew that whatever was out there, it was still a threat. But for now, at least, things were quiet. I just hoped it would stay that way. Months passed without incident, and I started to believe that maybe, just maybe, the creature had moved on. But deep down, I knew it was only a matter of time before it returned. I kept my rifle close and my eyes open, always ready for the next encounter. Then, one night, it happened. I was out in the pasture, checking on the herd, when I heard a scream. It was a gut-wrenching sound, full of terror and pain. I ran toward the source, my flashlight beam cutting through the darkness. When I got there, I saw Charlie lying on the ground, his body torn and bloodied. The creature was standing over him, its eyes glowing in the darkness. Without thinking, I raised my rifle and fired. The creature let out a roar of pain and turned on me, its claws slashing through the air. I barely had time to react, dodging to the side as it lunged at me. I fired again, hitting it in the chest. The creature stumbled back, letting out a final, pitiful howl before collapsing to the ground. I approached it cautiously, my rifle still trained on its body. It was dead, its lifeless eyes staring up at the night sky. I felt a mix of relief and sorrow. We had finally killed the beast, but at what cost? Charlie's death hit us hard. He was a good man, and his loss left a hole in our small community. We buried him on the ranch under a large oak tree where he used to sit and smoke his pipe during breaks. In the weeks that followed, the ranch slowly returned to normal. The cattle were safe, and the mysterious deaths ceased. But the memory of that creature, and the terror it brought, lingered. I knew I'd never forget those glowing eyes, or the way it moved through the darkness. As for me, life went on. I continued to manage the ranch, working the land and caring for the animals. But I was always on guard always watching the horizon for any sign of danger. The experience had changed me, made me more cautious, more aware of the things that lurk in the shadows. Sometimes when I'm sitting on the porch, watching the sunset, I think about Charlie and the others who lost their lives to that creature. I wonder if there are more like it out there, waiting in the dark, and I know that if they ever come, I'll be ready. Years later, the story of the creature became a local legend, something the townsfolk would talk about over beers at the local bar. They'd embellish the details, adding their own twists and turns. But I knew the truth. I had lived it. And so, life in Kingman continued, 
the memory of that terrifying summer slowly fading into the past. But for me, the scars remained. Not just the physical ones, but the ones etched into my mind. My name is Austin Pelkey, and this happened to me in 2016. I was a regular guy, just out of college, working a dead-end job at a hardware store in Arkville, a small town tucked away in the Catskill Mountains. I'd grown up in the city, so the whole small-town vibe was new to me. I moved here because my uncle George owned a cabin and offered me a cheap place to stay. I figured, why not? I could save some money, breathe fresh air, maybe figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Plus, the place had Wi-Fi, which was pretty much all I needed. George was one of those old-school types, gruff, no-nonsense, and perpetually busy. He spent most of his time out in the woods, hunting or fishing. He tried teaching me a few things, but honestly, I was more interested in my Xbox and Netflix. Still, I liked the guy. He was the closest thing I had to a dad since my old man took off when I was a kid. It was a Friday night, and I'd just finished a long shift at the hardware store. My coworker Melanie invited me to a bonfire party out by the lake. Melanie was cool, a bit of a tomboy, and the only person I'd befriended in town. I figured a few beers and some laughs wouldn't hurt. When I got home, George was packing up for one of his weekend hunting trips. Hey, Austin, he said without looking up from his gear. I'm heading out for a few days. You gonna be all right? Yeah, sure, I replied, grabbing a soda from the fridge. Going to a party tonight with Melanie. Should be fun. Just be careful out there, he said, finally making eye contact. The woods can be dangerous at night. I shrugged it off, as any twenty-something would. I mean... What's the worst that could happen? Bears? Wolves? I doubted it. The most dangerous thing I expected to encounter was a skunk or maybe a drunk local. The bonfire was in full swing by the time I got there. People I recognized from the store and a few other places were milling about, drinking, laughing, and generally having a good time. Melanie spotted me and waved me over. About time you showed up, she teased, handing me a beer thought you got lost. Nah, just had to make sure my uncle wasn't going to miss me too much, I joked, cracking the can open. What did I miss? Not much, just the usual town gossip, she said, rolling her eyes. You know how it is. We chatted for a while, shared a few laughs, and the night wore on. The fire crackled, casting long shadows into the dark woods beyond. I remember feeling relaxed, even happy, for the first time in a long while. It was a nice change of pace from my usual routine. Around midnight, Melanie suggested we take a walk down by the lake. I agreed, needing to stretch my legs and get away from the crowd for a bit. We strolled along the shore, talking about everything and nothing. It was peaceful, the kind of quiet you only get out in the country. Then we heard it, a low, guttural noise coming from the woods. Melanie and I stopped in our tracks, exchanging puzzled glances. What the hell was that? She whispered. Probably just an animal, I said, trying to sound confident. A coyote or something. That didn't sound like any coyote I've ever heard, she replied, her voice tinged with fear. I was about to suggest we head back to the bonfire when we heard it again, closer this time. My heart started to pound. There was something unsettling about the sound, something that set my nerves on edge. Maybe we should go back, Melanie said, her eyes wide. Yeah, good idea, I agreed, turning to head back up the path. That's when we saw it, a hulking figure standing just at the edge of the trees. It was tall, easily over six feet, and covered in dark fur. Its eyes glinted in the firelight, and its teeth... I don't think I've ever seen anything like it. They were sharp, menacing. Run! I yelled, grabbing Melanie's hand and pulling her along. We sprinted back toward the bonfire, my mind racing. What the hell was that thing? A bear? No, it didn't look like any bear I'd ever seen. We burst into the clearing, gasping for breath. I tried to explain what we'd seen, but my words came out jumbled and frantic. The others laughed it off, blaming it on the beer or a trick of the light. 
Relax, man, said Randy, one of the locals. You've probably just seen a deer or something. But Melanie and I knew what we saw. It wasn't a deer. It wasn't anything that should be out there. The rest of the night was a blur. I stayed close to the fire, my eyes darting toward the woods, half expecting the creature to come charging out at any moment. But it didn't. Eventually, people started to leave, and the party died down. Melanie offered me a ride home, and I gladly accepted. There was no way I was walking back through those woods alone. I didn't sleep much that night. My mind kept replaying the encounter, trying to make sense of it. By morning, I decided I had to do something. I couldn't just sit around and pretend it hadn't happened. So, I called George. Hey, Uncle George, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. You got a minute? Sure, kid. What's up? I told him everything, from the bonfire to the walk by the lake and the creature we'd seen. There was a long pause on the other end of the line. Did you hear me? I asked, starting to feel impatient. I heard you, he finally replied. Austin, listen to me carefully. Stay inside. Keep the doors and windows locked. I'll be back as soon as I can. What? Why? I demanded. What is it? It's a long story, he said, his tone serious. Just do as I say, all right? I agreed, more out of confusion than anything else. What did George know that I didn't? I spent the rest of the day inside, trying to distract myself with video games and TV, but my mind kept drifting back to the woods and that creature. George returned the next day, looking more serious than I'd ever seen him. He had his hunting rifle with him, which was unusual. George never brought his guns into the house. All right, kid, he said, sitting me down at the kitchen table. It's time you knew the truth. He proceeded to tell me about the legends of the area, stories passed down through generations. According to him, there was something out there, a creature that was neither man nor beast. Some called it a werewolf, but George didn't like that term. He said it was too Hollywood, too sensational. But whatever it was, it was real, and it was dangerous. I've seen it before, he admitted, his voice low. Years ago, when I was about your age, my friends and I went camping out by the lake just like you. We heard the same noises, saw the same figure. Two of my friends didn't make it back. I stared at him, my mind reeling. This was insane. It couldn't be true. But the look in George's eyes told me he believed every word. So what do we do? I asked, feeling a knot of fear in my stomach. We stay vigilant, he said. And if it comes near, we defend ourselves. The next few days were tense. George and I stayed close to the cabin, keeping the rifle within arm's reach. Melanie came over a couple of times, and we filled her in on what George had told me. She took it surprisingly well, considering. I knew there was something off about this place, she said. My grandpa used to tell stories about strange things in the woods, but I always thought he was just trying to scare me. One night, we heard it again, the same low, guttural noise echoing through the trees. George grabbed the rifle and we went out onto the porch, straining to see into the darkness. The moon was bright, casting long shadows across the yard. There, Melanie whispered, pointing toward the tree line. The creature was back, its eyes glowing in the moonlight. It stood there watching us, its breath visible in the cool night air. George raised the rifle, aiming carefully. Get inside, he ordered not taking his eyes off the creature. Melanie and I retreated into the cabin, peeking out from behind the door. George fired a shot, the sound echoing through the night. The creature let out a howl and disappeared into the woods. For a moment, we all stood there breathless, waiting. But it didn't come back. The next day, George decided we needed to do something more. He couldn't stay and protect us forever. We had to find a way to deal with the creature once and for all. He contacted a friend of his, a man named Marcus, who supposedly knew about these things. Marcus arrived the following evening, a rugged-looking guy with a no-nonsense attitude. We need to track it, Marcus said, after George filled him in. Find its lair and take it out. It sounded crazy, 
but what choice did we have? We couldn't live in fear forever. So, armed with rifles and flashlights, we ventured into the woods, following the tracks Marcus claimed belonged to the creature. We walked for hours, deeper into the forest than I'd ever been. The trees closed in around us, and the air grew colder. I kept close to George, my heart pounding in my chest. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig made me jump. Finally, we reached a clearing. In the center was an old, dilapidated cabin, its roof caved in and windows shattered. Marcus held up a hand, signaling us to stop. This is it, he whispered. Stay alert. We approached the cabin cautiously, our flashlights cutting through the darkness. The place reeked of decay, and the ground was littered with bones. My stomach turned at the sight. Suddenly the creature appeared, charging at us from the shadows. It was fast, too fast. Marcus fired his rifle, but the creature dodged and knocked him to the ground. George and I opened fire, the bullets tearing into its flesh. The creature let out a deafening roar and slashed at George, sending him sprawling. I didn't think. I just reacted. I grabbed the nearest weapon, a rusty machete lying among the bones, and swung at the creature. It yelped in pain, stumbling back. I kept swinging, driven by fear and adrenaline, until the creature collapsed, lifeless, at my feet. We stood there, panting, staring at the creature's body. It was over. We had killed it. George was hurt, but alive. Marcus helped him up, and we made our way back to our cabin. The sun was rising, casting a pale light over the forest. For the first time in days, I felt a sense of relief. We didn't talk much on the way back. There wasn't much to say. We had faced something unimaginable and survived. But the scars, both physical and mental, would stay with us. In the weeks that followed, life slowly returned to normal. George's wounds healed, and the nightmares began to fade. Melanie and I grew closer, bonded by the shared experience. We never spoke of the creature again, not in detail. It was a chapter of our lives we were eager to close. George went back to his hunting trips, but he never ventured too far. I eventually moved back to the city, finding a job and trying to put the past behind me. Melanie visited often, and we stayed close, a constant reminder of the ordeal we had survived. Years later, I still think about that night sometimes, especially when the moon is full and the air grows cold. I wonder if there are more creatures out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting. But then I shake it off, focusing on the present, grateful for the life I have and the people in it. The past is a dark place, full of shadows and mysteries, but it's also a part of who I am, a reminder that even in the face of unimaginable horror, we can find the strength to survive. And that, in the end, is what matters most.